Hi everyone, this is Felix Tonomakis, um, therapist and admin of the forum that we're doing this Facebook Live on with my good friend and colleague, Glenn Robertson. Um, for those new members who don't know, um, I've got a unique approach to our field called the four, four R's, uh, which I've developed. I haven't trained that many people. Uh, Glenn is by far the shining star. I think I trained, uh, I went to Australia. Glenn is in Melbourne, based in Melbourne, 2016 or so, Glenn, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Was, yeah. And, uh, and, you know, Glenn said, I've never heard of Arthur before. And since then, Glenn is now the leading person in Australia, the most prolific person, the most successful person after me in the world. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, but he has a, he has a far more popular uh, YouTube video because he used Doodlify. So I'm still mad at him about that. He's really stolen my thunder. But, uh, yeah. but the, the point is, we uh, we like to raise awareness of Arthur. So, you know, whatever works, we don't mind. We're doing these free things as well to raise awareness. Yeah, so absolutely. If like, yeah, if you like more information, check out, you know, Glenn's Doodly Fight. It's brilliant YouTube video. It's more comprehensive than mine. Um, and, um, and I'm going to put some, we're going to do this monthly, I think, Glenn, the first Friday of every month. Yeah. I think, you know, we yeah. might not just promote it in the forums on Facebook, but, you know, put it on some other pages or something like that. Really start raising awareness. Um, so that's the background. And um, yeah, we're going to launch straight into it. For those on the Facebook forum uh, already listening or watching this, please let us know any questions. We have some things we're going to talk about. And if brilliant questions occur to you after we finish, then we can do it next time. So that's OK. Yeah. So if anybody, by the way, has any problem hearing me or seeing us in any way or, or hearing Glenn as well, do let us know so we can adjust this. Otherwise, we're going to launch into it. So I think it's okay, Glenn. So nice to see you again. <laughs> yeah, very nice. For, it was only uh, five weeks or six weeks ago. I was in sunny yeah. London. So yeah, very, uh, very sunny. lovely. Look at it now. It's, uh, it's slightly different. Yeah, autumn, autumn is beautiful. But um, yeah. yeah, so uh, Glenn and I, uh, we talk shop, exchange notes a lot, got a wealth of information between us, coming up to maybe 7,000 people seeing, which is far more than anyone else you know, by far, you know, much more than the input output of a hospital, for example, you would get through people quickly with this approach. So yes. um, today um, it's open and we're going to start with a couple of things. I'm going to start with the first part, some living with an offered child, some tips about that, best way to deal with food issues, uh, followed by um, some sort of tips for parents, which is ongoing and any other issues people ask us about. Yeah. So without further ado, I mean, Glenn, do you, do you want to start with, um, should we? Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll jump in and start. And um, of course, jump in any time. Um, I think living with an after child, maybe we can break it up into, you know, that life before seeking therapy. And then, you know, what do we do after therapy? Yeah. There's so many parents come in, Felix has got them as well. And, and so we hear the stories of how people cope with that alpha child. So some of the things that really seem to help uh, in no particular order to take the pressure off everybody, parents need to stop blaming themselves. Mm. You know, it, it's not your fault. It's just one of those things that happens. Uh, yeah. The personality of your child that they were brought into the, the planet with, you know, made them susceptible for some particular reason to this thing we call alpha. It was their reaction to something, whether emotional, physical. So parents got to stop blaming themselves. I yeah. think uh, one of the things that's really helpful is if you can get your hands on some educational material, go on Felix's site. There's, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of videos of how he's dealt with it over the years, whether it's Felix or mine or someone else's, find some good information on Arford and share it with family members. So it's not a secret for your family that other people begin to understand. And when they understand, the pressure starts to come off. Um, controversially, the next port I'm going to talk about, Felix is going to jump in. And we're, we're not medical doctors. So if your child is severely underweight or, or, or needs some medical intervention, of course, you're going to take it to the GP. Uh, there may be need for a gastric tubes and a range of medical interventions. We're, we're talking about the psychological component. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, always get screened for things. And also, like anything, somebody comes in with anything that could be stuff, medical. Get that stuff. If they like some sort of food, get it into them. Uh, don't withhold it. Don't don't uh, try and bribe them by saying, oh, "Okay, if you try this thing, then you get." Don't do that. Just fill them up. There will be a time 
when that child is ready to change. But until that time comes, the parent's job is to fill that child up with whatever they can currently eat. What are your thoughts on that? Felix? Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. The first port of call is always rule out any medical issues. So you know, check for inflammation, check for Addison's, check, check for pans and pandas. Uh, and, and often a doctor won't know, they won't, it won't occur to them. So I'm afraid, like, like many things I'm finding, not just ARFID, we're actually educating doctors uh, because you know they're generalists in many ways and they've got a lot on their mind. And it's like, well, I'm talking to people, can you check for this or do that? It, it just won't occur to them. You know, you probably know more about ARFID than the doctor you're seeing on average, which is, which is unfortunate. So don't be afraid to push. Don't expect them to be an expert on everything. Rule out the things. And as Glenn said, uh, every child is different. Some, some children will be severely affected by a, a restricted diet. Um, in my experience, thousands of people, and Glenn as well, fortunately, that's relatively rare. Most people I see, um, e even not young children, I'm talking about 10, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 onwards, um, are you feeling the effects of your restricted diet? A little bit of low energy, le lethargy, fatigue, but otherwise fine. Not to mention I get the old, you know, checked him or her out with a doctor, fine, you know, lots of energy. So, I, you know, I, I know as a parent, first time going into this, you're thinking, my child cannot live off two foods. They're going to die in a year and I need therapy now. It's just not what we're seeing. Uh, the human system is highly resilient. It can extract nutrients from, you know, uh, anything really. And at, when you're young, obviously, the, the advantage is you can get away with that. You know, a 50-year-old man or woman, sure. But in the beginning, there's a lot of leeway. So I always say with Glenn, if possible, every six months makes a big difference cognitively. The longer, the better. The, the, the more mature the child is, the more they can focus, the better. In the meantime, uh, once you rule down medical problems, it, it's true that they're actually going to be okay for another six months or year until they're ready, rather than coming to see us wasting your money and the child saying, well, even those guys can help us. You know, it's, it's not good for the future. Um, we don't want to take your money. We want to help the child with the best timing. Right, Glenn? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. So taking all of those things as a, as a summary picture, but really, you know, parents should stop feeling guilty. It's not the way they cooked, what they presented. Uh, the child has that personality. Some personalities are gregarious. Uh, they leap into life and others are a little bit more cautious and all of the spectrum in between. The way that your child does life is the way that they do offered. You know, there's no difference between those two. So really, as therapists, uh, Felix and I, you know, when someone comes into our office, everybody's different. We're really uh, are cognitively looking at what the personality behavior is like, and we're going to adjust that therapy to match what we've got in front of us. So uh, parents, uh, you, you're aware of your children, you know what their strengths and weaknesses are. So support them in the best way possible. If they respond best to mild encouragement or, or, or soft way forward, do that. If they like to be challenged, we'll do that. But yeah. the big thing with ARFID is um, low pressure. That's the key, low pressure. Yeah, yeah. pressure is no one's friend is one of my mantras. And just to say, you know, it, it, what, what Glenn and I are offering are, are basically, there's no, there's no perfect solution. People say to me, you know, what's the right thing to do? And, and as if, you know, which antibiotic works with this? Um, this is very different because the child is a unique individual. As Glenn said, you've got to customize it to your child. And moreover, like normal parenting, a really good technique that gets them to do their homework for one age doesn't work, you know, in another age for them. So um, we're always adapting a little bit and, and adjusting the child, the child's adjusting to us as well. So, you know, as, as some, whatever we say, someone's going to say that would work for my child. And, and you'll be right. There's always exceptions to the rule. Um, but we are giving, you know, general tips um, and take from them what you will and customize it to your child. But uh, don't take this as this is the right way to help your child with ARFID. You know, it does depend on the child. And on this point on relativity, and on the forums, obviously, we get lots of new members and people say, you know, it, ARFID's hereditary, isn't it? ARFID's autism, ARFID's OCD, ARFID's, you know, all information and everything. There, there isn't one thing that creates ARFID. Um, lots of causes go into it. For some people, it's nothing to do with anything biologically. It's a pure learned experience, a learned trauma. Uh, other people, um, sensory processing disorder will play an aspect, neurodiversity. Um, 
But, you know, I think Glenn will agree, even when we have a child that, you know, their parents say, oh, his father or his mother has this as well, therapy can still be successful. You know, it's not the be all and end all. You have a predisposition, but you, you can override that in many ways, because a lot of it is also learned and, 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 and fear based as well, which, which exaggerates an existing biological predisposition. So it makes a hard thing really difficult as opposed to challenging for you compared to someone who's an inner foodie. Yeah. 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 Totally agree. Totally yeah. agree. In fact, I, I had some clients in just recently uh, who said that very same thing, you know, hmm. um, the mum was saying, uh, no, his dad suffers from Harford. Uh, yeah. Therefore that's why the child has got Harford. You know, if, if a child sees a parent uh, visually afraid of food, uh, every single meal time, then they're going to learn from that. The parents, the authority yeah. figure. So it's going to be a mixture of both things going on. Yeah, cool. absolutely. And, and now um, a little bit also about, you know, you said it, empathy, you know, try and put yourself in the child's shoes. And I'm, I'm still learning with this because I've got a 13-year-old boy who is a little neurodiverse, a bit of ADHD, a little bit of other stuff. And, you know, it's a mine of wealth of information because, for example, um everyone else is like okay with having a photo oh can everyone can all the children just line up and take a nice photo and he always had a problem with that and you know my wife and i was thinking oh for god's sake you know we've organized this we paid for this just give us a bleeding photo it's not much to ask right but then you've got to put your therapist hat on and say under what circumstances would a child have an issue with this right so if a child is a bit socially awkward then they feel anxiety in social situations. They feel embarrassed. They feel self-conscious. And all they think about is, I've got this unpleasant feeling, run, avoid. And that's all. And also there's that three-foot world. That's all they focus on. They don't think, well, hold on a second. Think about mum or dad. They're nice people. They've done a lot for me. You know, all he can think about is pain avoidance. It's very survival-based kind of um, thinking. So um, when you understand that, you think, okay, for him, it's not like, okay, line up, smile. For him, it's something else. It's a bigger deal. And I think with, um, you know, with some Narfid stuff, you've got a child here that their mind just says, I don't trust this food, flee, flee. And it's not logical. You know, by the parents say, but darling, you like orange juice, just try an orange. No, no, I can't. But it's, we can't hurt you, so why don't you try it? And all the child knows is, danger, danger, flee, flee, and they're stuck in that. And it's frustrating for them as well. Trust me, they don't like, I'm gonna piss off mom and, <laughs> mom and dad today, you know, they don't have enough on their plate. It really is, they're acting very impulsively, very knee jerk reflexively. And as we know that, that takes the personalization away and the sense of my child's just being difficult. But now, some children do have reasons where they like the power, they're on a bit of a power trip, but they're in the minority, you know, but most children will be um, I'm just scared and I can't think. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I, I agree. Here's something else that's interesting. Um, if you were to ask a, a child uh, with Arford or has got that behavior, well, yeah. what is it that you want to do? Uh, what is it that you would like to try? Many of them can't answer that question because yeah. they're living in an environment where they've never been able to do those things. So yeah. it, it sometimes, and I'm a parent, Felix is a parent. So Sometimes we can get frustrated when it seems as obvious as the nose on your face, but to that child with Arford, they're living in a, a completely different world uh, of perception that we're living in. So sometimes it's nice just to take a back step and say, if the child is not giving you the answers uh, genuinely that you expect, uh, just take another look and, and look at the parameters we're trying to ask. Maybe they need assistance in, in a different way or some suggestions. Uh, yeah. Children will really pick up on suggestions quite quickly and, and yeah. just reframe that. So uh, that, that's just something to be aware of. Yeah, and, and one of the things that um, we use in our approach is this idea that we work with this little Arfid part of the mind. And, you know, one of the questions is, you know, how do you feel about this little part of your mind that's stopping you eating pizza, the way your brother or sister can eat pizza, et cetera? And you see a child go, I hate this part. I'm really disappointed. I'm really embarrassed, really ashamed. And it's almost like the parents are going, oh, you are? Because you sort of look like, I don't care, you know, I'm indifferent. I'm not eating it because I'm just being difficult and fussy. And they realize, whoa, there's a lot more going on with my child than I was aware of. You know, they're not doing this just because they're being fussy. That's why I, I really hate the term fussy eater. You know, fussy yeah. is, oh, there's a bit of a blemish on my apple. You know, that, that's fussy. 
This is, yeah. I will rather starve to death, which we have seen people close the edge of, rather than eat. That's not fussy, that's panic. Yeah. yeah. So um, yes. your child is not doing this in 99.9% of the cases just to add to your workload. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, something else that's interesting is, and of course, you know, we're speaking global, but the client is individual. Quite a large number of clients that come in with this Arford challenge, people might call them stressed or, or anxious. Yeah, we don't quite like that terminology. I think it's nicer to think of that person as more sensitive. Now, a yeah. sensitive person feels the pressure of the world on them quickly. Yeah. They'll feel an emotion, uh, yeah. something will happen, and th they'll feel that. Someone standing next to them may have no feeling at all about what's just happened, but it's impacted them yeah. and it's stayed yeah. inside and will be with them for a while. So, you know, thank goodness for the world that's got sensitive people. They've made the world a wonderful place. Yeah. But those people need a bit of bulletproofing so that yeah. they can be part of the world without it affecting us. And therapy that Felix and I do, and this is, this is not a sales pitch for it, but that's a really important part of it. So the child can start to feel that they are the boss of them that they can really start to make decisions without the world making them for them. Yeah. What do you think about that, Felix? Yeah, yeah no, that, that's absolutely right. I mean, I, I do feel for the sensitive child, once again, putting ourselves in their shoes, the world is a more intense place for them right from the get-go. So, yeah. you know, if you've got any sensory processing, everything's brighter, more intense, sounds, the textures, bath is hot when I think it's lukewarm. So already a child's done of thinking, you know what, the world's pretty intense. And I've got to withdraw, I've got to shut down a little bit, I've got to turn things down. So that's why it's harder for some children like that. They need more convincing. If you have a yeah. child who um, is quite open, quite gregarious, they make very easy clients, almost always one session, because there's not much to do. You say, look, so your brain was doing it this way. Actually, it's better to do it this way. Let me show you how. Okay. And you have one session, they eat everything, no problem. A sensitive person is almost like, you know, very cautious checking out because, you know, they've been burnt so many times whenever they put feelers out. So that's why we say you need to respect the timing. You know, when we say it's a one session treatment, all things being equal without other stuff to deal with, it's a very easy, straightforward, effective treatment. But if there's more going on for a child, there's more going on. They've got to do it in their own pace, maybe need some reminders, some reassurance, reframing stuff. So that's why, you know, it's not an antibiotic. It depends on the child. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. One um, of the things that's uh, nice that we speak about, uh, maybe within the profession that we're in, is this this cycle of change concept. That, um, mm -hmm. and here's an example, a better example. Maybe Felix or I at, at, a, at a party and we're enjoying ourselves, and someone at the party knows that there's a hypnotist at the party, and inevitably the person that comes up and engages us is probably a smoker, right? Yeah. And they say, "Hey, Glenn, or Felix, I hear you're a hypnotist. Do you think you can help me with smoking?" And we say, "You know what?" Hypnotherapy is pretty good with smoking, whether it's us or someone else, worth mm. a go. Yeah. And they say, that's great, but do you think you can help me? And they say, yeah, I tell you what, I'm going to look at my schedule. Two days' time, I've got a free session for you. Why don't you pop in and we'll mm. do some change? At that moment, the person says, what, next Tuesday? Hang on, I don't think I'm ready for it. So they're verbalizing that they're ready, but they're really not ready. And sometimes yeah. with kids, we see that, oh, mum, I would like to do that. Yes, I want to see Felix. Yes, I want to see Glenn. But when the push comes to shove, they're just not ready on the day. Yeah. So that's okay. Let, let's, not, let's not be uh, overly negative on that child. They're saying the right things. They're getting there. Sooner or later, they'll be at the right place, but not always they are yeah. on the day. Yeah. So, you know, complaining does not mean commitment. Like, I'm unhappy with my situation doesn't mean, therefore, I'm jumping on therapy. It means I'm unhappy with what's happening but i haven't decided the next step i'm just at unhappy what we're looking for is someone that says i'm unhappy and ready and willing to do something about it you know i'm ready to listen yeah. to somebody who can help me is obviously the best client for us um yeah. it, also glenn I'm, I'm sure you relate to this people used to say to me do you do an assessment beforehand see if my child is suitable and i don't because i can't tell <laughs> um, if I did, I'd have got it wrong. You know, the amount of times I see a child turn up, I see a, you know, a little eight-year-old holding a teddy bear. I'm thinking, uh-oh, you know, this child's probably really young, really mature, and not going to get it. And bless her, she eats everything. Yeah. And this big, boisterous, gregarious child sometimes goes, yeah, yeah, I'm really ready. I'm going to tell, I'm going to show my friends everything. And then clams up. 
So if I had screened the boy will get flying colors and this shy little girl with the teddy bears, I don't think your child is ready. Actually, sure, she's just terrified, she's scared. But once I we do our thing to lower the, the, the fear about stuff and show her it's easy, she goes, okay, well, that sounds simple and does it. Yeah. So yeah. we can't tell in advance, you know, with children, anything can happen. It is the old fisherman's friend, suck it and see. It's trial and error. Um, so, you know, I don't want parents being disappointed to waste the money. That's right. Look, to stack the deck, increase chances, the older, the better. But if you think, you know what, it's my money, I'm going to see if anything sticks to the child, any little seeds go in. So can I, can you see my child on eight? Um, and they can focus in on everything. Um, okay, that's your choice. But, you know, we can't, you know, it's, we're not applying surgery that will work every time. Well, even surgery that doesn't actually, but um, you get the point with children. Anything can happen. They're developing. They're a big work in progress. You just can't predict things. It's uh, yes. trial and error. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's another question here. No, no, no. Sympathy, patience. Uh, on on the question, I was going to do questions at the end, but maybe we can take one now. Um, somebody mentioned about division of responsibilities. It applicable for a child of four. To be honest with you, this is a member of my forum. It's best to ask other parents because what Glenn and I see are obviously children that no other therapy has worked for. So we've got a very skewed and biased population, you know. Everybody I see, CBT hasn't worked, uh, chaining hasn't worked, this hasn't worked, nothing's worked, that's why they see us. Um, that's not to say it hasn't worked for other people, but I only see what I see, so does Glenn. So I think the best question is to ask other parents um, uh, about that. I mean, I, I don't know how much you can do with a three-year-old, to be honest with you, a four-year-old. I just, you know, don't think the cognitive systems are in place them to really understand a lot of things. Um, you know, I don't have fast smiley faces and stuff and all gold stars will take, um, as in making a meaningful change. Um, so, yeah, I, I, we, we stick to what we know uh, with that. Uh, other parents who have more experience. Um, very, very quickly, Glenn, somebody asked about sensory processing disorder. And I just want to say that I've, I have covered this many times before, but it's not always clear what's pure sensory processing and what's um, amplified by fear and what's psychosomatic. Um, pure sensory processing where someone says, I'm genuinely not afraid of food, I can try anything, I just don't like it, don't like it, don't like it, don't like it, is actually quite rare, you know, to, to my surprise. I find most of the cases you have a background sensory sensitivity that's then massively amplified by fear. So by reducing the fear, people think it's and instead of being an impossible challenge, it's like a difficult challenge, you know? So sometimes that's the best we can do. Yeah, they, they don't love food. They're not foodies, um, although they love some foods a lot. Um, they're not foodies across the board like someone else without it, but, you know, it's still a massive improvement from what it was before. So, you know, it, it is what it is. We work with what we got. But, yeah. you know, just saying it's just this or just that is actually quite rare, you know? Um, so lots of multi-variable causes can feed into it. And we look at any psychology based that then becomes influences psychosomatic um, symptoms. Yeah. Yeah, I might, I might add to that that, that yeah. sometimes the sensory processing issue is is nearly mirroring the allergy issue. So, you know, many children will have an allergy at birth, and then as the years go on, it gets less and less as that body matures. Sometimes with sensory processing, it's a very heightened experience in the younger years, and it can tend to be more manageable as it goes on. But the experience that the young body has already got from that heightened sensory processing when they're young, even though the sensory processing itself may ease off, it's the memory of the experience from when they were young stuck with yeah. them and tends to create for some people this Arford type behavior and other things as well. So yeah, uh, I'm agreeing with Felix 100%. Yeah. It's fear, which is the fuel for sensory processing. Yeah. If we can dial that down, we've got yeah. an opportunity to make some change. And that's actually an analogy I use. We want to reduce the fuel, you know, fanning the flames of this Arford fear um, to, to whatever level we can. So yes. I think, Glenn, at the moment, yeah, we're going to switch to, I think we've already started talking about <laughs> working with understanding our fit child to working with our fit child. So um, well, no questions at the moment, that's fine. You know, it's a strange time for most people, you know, 9.25 UK time. Um, 
So another thing that I want to talk about uh, is anything else, Glenn, on that aspect, or shall we? I think I think pre therapy, whether it's with us or with anything, I think they're the important parts. Uh, we can probably move on and and talk about uh, maybe afterwards. That would be really cool. Okay, we could do that. Yeah, fun has. So the other thing I want to say a little bit on some tips with parents. And again, yeah. you know, nothing works for every parent and every child. Um, I've put up a list of tips on the forum, so I won't be repeating all those again. Um, I just want to say a couple of things. And, and this is because I saw a child um, recently, and that's what inspired me to do this. And um, this was basically um, a child was offered some food and was looking a little bit uncomfortable. And the mother jumps in and goes, okay, don't worry, you have to do it, you have to do it. And that's actually, that's actually interfering with the process because it's okay for the child to go through some distress, some adversity. In their mind, they're going, okay, this is tough, but I reckon we can do it. Now, let's think about what Felix said. But they're still in the process of finding their own strengths with that. And I know in this day and age, you know, the, the thing that like, no one's allowed to be offended or upset, we've got to jump in. It's like, you know, why can't you be distressed? Why can't you have a bad day? Why can't you be offended by stuff and then work it through and decide it's not the end of the world? You know, that's what builds up the tolerance. Every time we jump in to say, you know, handling distress or discomfort or, or being offended is the worst thing in the world. We've got to stop it. You know, it's enabling that. No one ever learns to get past it. So what we need yeah. to do, you know, save that child to tell the mother, I know you're a parent. We have empathy, but, you know, adversity is actually good for our development. Adversity is what challenges our immune system to be stronger. Adversity is what stresses the muscles to grow bigger. And psychological adversity done in balance is a sense of I'm facing my fears, not running away, with the information. And as I stay with those feelings, the feelings aren't as powerful as they used to be. And I proceed and I get a result and I do it again. I do it again, like swimming. So that's a process that is important. And we can't go rushing in to save them all the time because it's not actually doing them a service. Um, so um, let's go even more than that. It's not nice to watch a poor child weeping or something, you know, with frustration, but, you know, life is tough. We've got to help a child now rather than make it harder for them to learn later. So if a child's weeping with frustration, I still work with it. And often they're like, yeah, you know, and they're expressing an emotion, then they'll still go and eat food. You know, you're coaching them. Um, on that end of the level, there's a child who sort of starts having a bit of a tantrum, um, having tears. And again, it's like, you know, in England, there's 25 different kinds of rain because we have a lot. There's different kinds of tears. And one tear is, I feel uncomfortable. I'm sending distress calls. Take this away from me. And, you know, parents don't want to see their child distressed, so they might stop and everything. Well, I say, well, hold on a second. Have empathy and acknowledge, but work through. So what I'd say is, okay, I know you feel maybe upset or scared or something. That's normal. But, you know, just take a moment and just tell me what are those tears about exactly? You know, I know you feel scared, but I want to understand a little bit more. When you see this food, despite what we said, someone inside jumps up and feels something. What's that part feeling? And what we're doing is we're talking them through it rather than saying, I feel bad, avoid. It's like, stay with it. And what is it exactly about? And as you, you know, stay with it and think, what I'm actually panicking about, is it this or this? Then you, we, you know, we, we remind them what we said, we've done this, we explain other ways. And they're going like, oh, okay. And then they might even eat food, you know, in that session. So as a parent, I think what most people do is, come on, try it, but just try it. Oh, just one little bite. Oh, for God's sake. Wow, wow, it is. Oh, for God's sake. You know, I hate mealtimes. We've got a lot on our plate. The world is stressful, but it's like, okay, hold on a second. If you're genuinely panicked and terrified, and you're my child, love you, I don't want to stress you, but just take a minute. I want to know more information. What about that specifically is the scary thing for you? You know, you're always saying stuff like that. You get a child think, well, you know, you make them accountable a little bit for, well, what am I actually? Is it, Carlo, no, we've been through that. Is it this? Is it that? And um, that's part of a process. So, you know, sometimes growth is a bit painful, uh, you know, and this is part of it. So yeah, it's easier with therapy skills, but everybody's on high emotion. And so we're reacting emotionally. And this is an idea of just taking a step back and not being put off immediately by tears, but saying, hold on a second, fine. You know, I'm sure it seems what it seems. What does it seem for you? Scary? I'm sure it seems scary, but 
you know, when you think about it, what what's the actual thing that scares you about that? Yeah? Now, they yeah. still might clam up, but often they go home and think, uh, okay, you know, I've actually stayed through the process for a change and actually learned a thing or two. So, yes. um, yeah, how do you feel about that, Glenn? Yeah, um, I agree with that. And I think something that you said nicely uh, early on was this, it's a new world for somebody at the end of therapy. Doesn't mean at the end of therapy, the fingers clicked and you know everything is normal, but there's a subtle difference between phobic fear and normal nerves. And sometimes for the client, this is the first time that they're actually feeling normal nerves about yeah. doing something new rather than being shut down by this uh, large phobic fear. And it's difficult sometimes for the parent to see this in a different light. And yeah. Felix was saying earlier that sometimes um, clients just take a while to process at the end of the session. They're holding the food. You know, we're all learners. So I've had to learn. What I now do is I just, I don't say anything. I yeah. just I just sit back and, and I can see it happening. It would be easy for me to jump in and start explaining it, what's going on. But I know initially if I just sit there and I just let them sit with that bird or a bit of carrot or something, mm -hmm. nine times out of 10, all of a sudden it moves in and the process starts working because they're thinking through it in their own way, not my way. They're thinking yeah. through it in their own exactly. way. And I think that's one of the nice things that come out of therapy at the end. Yeah. So a, a nice, uh, you know, nice thing I've got in the back of my head is either, I either win or I learn. Yeah. So if the yeah. child eats, great. If they're not, I don't say, oh, well, you know, you say, OK, hold on. You know, what's that about? What about this? But remember when this, if you can do this and you can do that. So what would you say yeah. to your brain now? And they often eat the food again second time. So, you know, there's that initial surge of, oh, my gosh, wait a minute. I'm going to eat food. I traditionally panic, don't I? Flee. And you say, okay, you've gone into that old groove. Remember the new groove and just do it. And let's talk it through and they eat a bit more of the grain. You're just nudging them and directing them towards something useful because then instinct is to flee in the old way. And you're saying, no, no, remember doing this way. So, um, you know, when, when people, you know, I can't say this enough because it still happens a lot. Can you do the hypnotherapy? Can you do the surgery? Can you give them that magic thing that will make them eat food? It's like, it's one of many things we do. It's educational, it's understanding it's a different way, it's coaching, it, it's a bunch of things done together. It's not a one thing we do um, yeah. because everyone's different and depends on, you know, the, the skill that the child needs is what we focus on more. So it's, it's really hard to answer the question like, can you help my child with hypnotherapy? <laughs> That's a big question. There's a, there's a lot of components in that. So um, I'm sure you get the same, Glenn. Yeah. Well, I'm just going to go back um, six years ago or seven years ago when, when uh, I first saw Felix working with uh, clients on a stage of all places. So uh, it was a pretty intense uh, light environment. And you know what, um, this, I, I'd come from that background where hypnosis with someone's eyes are closed, and you've got to take them into, and this is the first time I saw someone, Felix, by the way, first time I saw someone working with a young child, eyes were open, weren't even closed, they're fidgeting and they're moving around in the chair. Mm -hmm. And because there was a process that happened before the so-called hypnosis, the hypnosis is lovely to have and sometimes can be consolidating on what gone on in the session but it is not the most important part of the process. Mm -hmm. It's what the client listens to. It's the education. It's yeah. viewing the world in a different way. There's a change of perception that goes on. And when that subtle change happens, they can never see the world the same way again. Yeah. And if we do our jobs well, that's, that's the mystery of our job, not the hypnosis. The magic comes in yeah. us being able to show the client how to see the world differently. Yeah. And, and that's why, Glenn... Uh, my therapy training is not popular because everybody yeah. wants like, can you teach me something to slam someone into hypnosis and make them do my bidding? And, you know, my therapy is, is I think, mature therapy. It involves a lot of components, a lot of psychological mindedness, understanding dynamics, you know, because I'm a therapist as well as a hypnotherapist. And so a lot of people are like, oh, you know, I'm hoping for some wham bam technique, you know, like other people offer. Whereas you've got the maturity and their psychological mindness to understand all these components, which is why you do and why you're good at it. And, oh, you know, of the people I've taught, I think only you and, you know, really understanding fully and getting and doing it that way. You know, people take aspects of it that works really well. But um, 
you know, that, that's why it's not, you know, can you train me in this and that? Well, you know, I can show you techniques and stuff, but there's still an element of understanding the human psyche. And, you know, it's a dance of push, pull, pull, you know, and, yeah. and there's all these things that sort of understanding client, um, you can't really teach uh, as it's, it's a lifelong learning process. So that's why, you know, I'm not, I'm not so enthused about how to teach the world this because what, you know, really depends on the quality of the student and understand how much you're understanding. And, you, you know, I can't control that. So, you know, it's actually relatively few and far between. Um, so well done, Glenn, for being so, so good. <laughs> um, Thank you very well, much. Can I talk about one thing for parents? Yeah. It's um, once a process has gone through, whether it's Felix or myself or someone else, parents believe that their job then is to be encouraging. OK, uh, so I just have to be up front and say encouragement is also pressure in, in mm -hmm. certain ways. So sometimes we can be there for our child. We can support them in turning up and doing things at a certain time. But the gushing praise, oh, that's wonderful. Well done. You know, it, with Arthur, that, that certainly doesn't help post therapy. Yeah, it's pressure. The, the role pressure. of the parent is to be there, supportive. OK, let's look at a time of day that we're going to try these new things once a habit is formed. You can do away with that stuff, but just to be there and be supportive, but not be overly enthusiastic. Yeah. Be yeah. enthusiastic on the inside, dance and yeah. cry on the inside, but don't do it on the outside. <laughs> That's such a good point. That's why, you know, when you've got a child who's eating nuggets and fries and then is eating lasagna, I don't make a big deal out of it because I'm trying to communicate. Yeah. Well, it's normal. You're meant to do that. You know, yeah. so I'm like, oh my God, you ate lasagna. Look, Mark, look at him, you know, because it's like, oh, this is a big deal. Is it one off? Is it just a day? You want to say, yeah, we're designed to eat anything and you're doing it. It's the natural way. So well done. Yeah. It's very low key, given that idea. Yeah, you're doing something your body knows how to do. And that actually gives more confidence. Gushing means like, oh God, you're on a lucky streak. Let's not ruin that, you know? Yeah. Um, which is it? Yeah, your brain knows how to do it. So, um, yeah. All these little little tips make it very normalizing. Um, yeah, oh, I, and the praise the praise that Felix and I would give a client at the end of the session has got nothing to do whether they like the food or not. That that's an irrelevant part of the yeah. process. We what we give feedback on is oh well done you picked up the food you checked it out and you decided yeah. for yourself whether you liked it or not. Yeah. That's fantastic. Whether you like it or not is something that will yeah. develop over time and can change. But what won't change is your ability to be the boss of you, check it out and explore. That's the key to moving forward. Yeah, yeah. So you see a growth and learning process. It's not just hypnosis, bam, change. It, it's, it's a lot of things. And yeah. the child will go at their own time and speed and rate of understanding yes. and maturity yes. as well. Things not in our control. Um, I just want to close the loop on something we said before about the, the tears <clears throat> where I work through them. There is an extreme version, which I begin to appreciate with neurodiverse children. <clears throat> now, usually Glenn will, will cause we spoke about as many times, autistic children make brilliant clients because uh, that is um, up high functioning, moderate, sometimes aspects of low because they're very good at obeying instruction or being following instructions. So you say, now do this with your mind, they just do it. You know, they don't second guess. Someone told me to do it. I do it literally, brilliant, you know? I, I think I had four autistic children last week. They're all brilliant, you know, I just said, bring it on. Um, on the extreme end of the spectrum, you know, I got a wake up call where I work with a child, I think 12 years old. And I didn't understand, you know, the, 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 the depths of this because I'm, Oh, starting my therapy in five minutes. Okay, so I'd like to show you how to work them right now. Well, but I just don't think it'll work for me. And I don't think this. And he starts um, defeating, defeating everything I say within a few minutes. And I haven't even had a chance to really speak. And all I said was, all right, you know, because I'm a bit joking in therapy. I don't have airs and graces. I go, all right, well, you know, give us a chance. I haven't explained everything yet. Expecting a bit of a laugh or something. And the child starts doing that, then runs to the room and has a tantrum. And I just learned some children, you know, they don't understand um, someone contradicting them. They take it as a personal attack. Um, you know, when my wife um, points out there is all my ways, I, you know, I think fair enough. I'm a bit, you know, relative to you, I'm a bit more uh, messy or something like this. And it's like, it's not like she doesn't love me and wants a divorce or anything. It's just like, by the way, that's annoying me a bit. Would you mind? It's like fair cop. But to a child that's got that more, um, linear view um disputing something becomes an attack on their personality on themselves 
And again, you know, I'm sorry to say, but you see this on social media. Like, I'm not criticizing you as a person. I just have a different viewpoint from what you're, you know, saying. And that's all. There's no way of looking at it. No, you know, I hate you and you hate to educate yourself. I'm shivering. Um, and all this stuff is like, uh, hold on. So when you're dealing with that, it's not about um, force of argument. You've got to go a really roundabout way uh, with that. And to be honest, it's not my skill set, you know, to, to I'm used to very quick therapy. So is Glenn. Uh, when I spoke to some other neurodiverse psychologists, it's obviously more sessions, slower process, a comfort toy, uh, this, you know, playing with sand for the longer process with that. So I'm afraid the child, probably that child will have to go to those kinds of services um, because the underlying dynamics are just too intense for my rapid fire approach. Um, but in general, most children, you can talk them through tears. Weeping is absolutely fine. Even something more than that is let them calm down and say, that's all right. You know, you're not freaked out. You're not, you just, that's all right. It's a reaction. You're learning. But what specifically is it about that? Just, just information. I'm not, you know, not want to eat food today, but, but what is it exactly that's bothering you? Just so I know. Yeah. yeah. Um, but there's always exceptions, as we said. Yeah. Um, so have we covered everything? How are we doing, Glenn? Any more questions? Have a quick look. Yes, it's, yeah, it's parent here. Difficult as a parent, know when to push and when to back off. Lots of health professionals recommend avoiding anxious situations like say dinner table with your family. You're talking so much, oh, thank you. Yeah, you know, there's a judgment call for everything. As I say, it is a dance where, you know, push and pull, push a bit, you know, not working today, but another you can push a bit more. It's how it is, I'm afraid. There's eternal yin and yang thing going on, which is you know, changing and dynamic. So um, to, to summarize, I think, you know, um, lots of putting yourself in the child's situation, understanding most children, they don't know what's going on for them. They're ashamed of it. They're embarrassed. They're frustrated. They're angry with their partner. And then they shut down a bit with that. And they're angry at themselves. So often people, you know, um, can try this no and like, now I'm upset because I can't do it. It's stupid. And I've upset my mom and I feel angry and I feel guilty. And they've got a whole bunch of things going on. Most children are not doing it to annoy you. Yeah. So, um, and, and one nice thing about that is I saw a six year old autistic boy that week and um, typical, not, not very expressive teenager. I do my therapy, he eats food. And then his parents sent me a feedback letter going, he's really opened up in other ways, just much nicer to be around and more open. I think, yeah, yeah, because this poor child was thinking, everybody thinks I'm an idiot, must be thinking they didn't, but I'm sure my parents think I'm an idiot. I'm, I'm ruining everything for my family. I'm like the bad guy. And why am I the bad guy? And what's wrong with me? And he's beating himself up. As soon as he eats food and goes, you know, it wasn't my fault. I wasn't doing this on purpose. I understand why my mind was doing it. I worked out, you know, all that hassle and pressure and judgments lifted. And it, you know, transformed the family. And I've heard that quite a few times. I'm sure you have as yeah. well, Glenn. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. The changes are on the inside. Uh, yeah. It reminds me of uh, a, a young child who's uh, been taken to piano lessons. And they, they get better at it. They're sitting there. They've got the, the, the teacher behind them. And, you know, it's a very intimate setting. And then at some point in time, they get pretty good at what they do. And the teacher says, I think you're ready to do this in front of all the parents at a recital. And they can do it wonderfully well in front of the teacher. But when the added pressure of the recital comes, some of them don't cope. They break down and the mind shuts off. Sometimes that's like after therapy. It's nice just to try it just with mum or dad there in a calm environment. If we throw that child into a restaurant setting or, or sitting yeah. with the family and everyone's looking, that extra pressure at those early stages can really make a big difference. So just be mindful that it's a process. It's like getting used to something new. We don't want to throw them in the deep end straight away. Yeah. And also, you know, children are so used to being passive, like I'm a kid, adults know everything. What do I know? But it's quite nice to say to them, you know, how would you like me to approach you with this? You know, and, um, you know, when you're eating food after the session, the next day, do you want me to comment on it? Do you want me to say, well done? Do you want more, more input? Or, you know, do you want to just be left alone? Um, how, what works for you? What makes you comfortable? Is what you want to say yeah. to the child. You know, take, take the lead from them and, and make them start thinking about their needs. Like, yeah, how, how do I want to be treated? Because often it's like, this is how I'm treated. I don't like it. 
and it stops there. Whereas taking responsibility is the key to therapy. If like, what do I want for me? And you know, how do I want to be treated? It's never too early to get a person to start thinking like I'm responsible for my needs and what do I want out of this? And then we communicate that to my partner or parent or something like that. So absolutely. Sometimes the goals can be stretching. A, a client, a young client might say, oh, after therapy, I want to go and have a Hawaiian pizza with my friends. That's the most important thing. And yeah. I normally say to them, you know, that, that'd be great. But how about this? How about mum or dad order Hawaiian pizza in at home? Yeah. You can try it at home where you feel comfortable. And when your brain says, hang on, that was okay. And we still feel good. The next time you go out with your friends, Hawaiian pizza is not the issue. You don't even think yeah. about it and you can enjoy yourself. So sometimes getting there takes two or three steps. Let's not yeah. expect to jump to the end point straight away. Yeah, yeah. And that's it. And that's what, you know, I can't really say enough in this day and age. When people say hypnosis, it's not stage hypnosis. You come yeah. up here, hypnotize you, you do the thing forever like a zombie. It just isn't that way. Okay, it is. It's a process of negotiation and understanding and leading apart. There's many things going on in actual therapy um it, it's not this drug that you you can take i think i hope people know that so um i think that's probably it glenn i think 45 minutes is is a good time to sort of pause we'll, we'll do it again first friday of every month i haven't yeah. seen any more questions at the moment so um yeah i think i think that's it so to those watching um Thank you. And if you think about anything we've said, then let us know. We'll continue it next time. But for now, um, hope you enjoyed it. And uh, we'll be covering lots of uh, important topics in the future as well. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.